Okay, so the next speaker will be Pierre Paolo Pandolfi from uh, the BI, and he will be talking about uh, a coding independent function of gene and pseudogene mRNAs <coughs> regulating tumor biology. So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks to the organizer. Thank you, Bruce, for this invitation. So I'm an outlier this afternoon. I work with mice. Actually, this is a mouse modeling or animal modeling section, and yet uh, I decided not to talk about mice, and perhaps not to talk about therapy too much, but uh, rather uh, to share with you a very, very exciting story, a story which we regard as uh, actually revolutionary, and uh, which has for sure revolutionized the way by which we study cancer genetics, uh, biology, and a story which has tremendous therapeutic uh, uh, implication. A story which is humbling and tells us uh, how little we know about uh, uh, cancer genetics. Now, uh, the only thing I will say about uh, mice and models is that uh, if you're interested, you can come in Longwood and I'll show you a beautiful example of a mouse hospital. Uh, the mouse hospital is actually up and running and it's up and running for uh, drug testing and optimization for cancer therapy, but also for other uh, disorders. And uh, believe it or not, the mouse hospital has all the equipments that you would have uh, in uh, the human hospital, Bruce. Yes, <laughs> trial accrual is on ongoing, and actually we are doing it co-clinically, seriously speaking. We are trying to synchronize the mouse uh, hospital efforts, uh, the preclinical efforts with the, with the human efforts. So uh, if you are interested in mouse modeling, you can leave the room because <laughs> now I will change completely gear and uh, uh, discuss this story, uh, which uh, is humbling, starting from the fact that it raises a very important question, in my opinion, uh, for this audience, uh, on whether we really uh, are dragging the relevant uh, molecular spaces in cancer and other diseases. We have spent two days to s discuss beautifully how to target uh, a finite subset of targets, which are draggable, we think, but uh, we are uh, not paying attention to huge dimensions, which uh, I think we are obliged to consider and to target if we want to eradicate uh, this disease. So do we have all the relevant targets for cancer therapy at end? A story which is based on a new theory, but don't get scared, I know it's after lunch. This theory is quite simple and yet quite transformative. A new theory about how RNA communicates. And so the key word of the whole story will be RNA, and you know that RNA are tough, cold, if you want to target them. And yet I'll show you that RNA are tremendously important. A new uh, uh, theory on how RNAs talk to each other, which is based on a new RNA language, which we think we have uncovered, which we call the CERNA code, and I'll tell you what CERNA means, which uh, in turn unravels a new biological dimension for coding and non-coding RNAs with therapeutic implication. A study uh, whose uh, foundation was reported a few months ago in a paper in Nature, which allows me to skip the data and focus on concepts and, and conceptual implication of the study. However, I want to read you the title of the story, uh, which gives you the keywords and the protagonist of the story. So the story is entitled, A Coding Independent Function of Genes and Pseudogenes mRNA. Again, to emphasize the RNA dimension and to emphasize another protagonist of the story, which is the pseudogene, this avatar genome, which we have neglected for so many years and which I, I will show we are able now to functionalize, as studied in the context of tumor uh, biology. Now, I will give you the theory and the implication, but I would like to uh, introduce the study by sharing with you four aspects which are probably relevant to all of you but are still mind-boggling to me since I'm a newcomer to this field. Every time I show this slide, I am in disbelief. I'm like the, mu the mutant zebra fish with the, uh, no <laughs> jaw. The first uh, point uh, I would like to make is how we have come to appreciate through comparative analysis of the transcriptome in an evolutionary fashion, how the uh, organism utilize differentially their genome. If you take single cell organisms such as E. coli or, or, or yeast, you would discover that they utilize their genome in its entirety, they transcribed it, and this is a transcribed genome which encodes for protein. So the vast majority of the genome in E. coli or yeast is a transcribed coding genome. This is in stark contrast with our genome, 
in Homo sapiens and in mammals, where only 2% of the genome is a coding genome. But the vast majority of our genome is transcribed, which in turn implies that the non-coding RNAs represent a larger fraction of the human transcriptome. And I don't know if this is uh, obvious to you, but uh, we have discussed for two days how to drag a few targets which r represent a minority of 2% of our genome, and we are not paying attention at all to the rest of the transcribed genome, and we don't pay attention at all to this because we don't know how it functions. We don't know what it means that our genome is expressed in transcript. We don't know how to functionalize this transcribed uh, space. And for sure, one uh, exciting dimension which of, uh, you have heard of is uh, certainly represented by the microRNA dimension. I will tell you what microRNA are briefly because they are indirectly protagonists of the story, but uh, microRNA are small and for sure they cannot represent the large fraction of the transcribed non-coding unit precisely because they are small. So microRNAs, which are so sexy and so well studied, so relevant to cancer, as you all know are small, uh, non-coding RNAs, 20 best pair in length, that uh, exert a very specific function after they are liberated after a long journey of processing, export, and maturation. What they do is to bind specifically to their mRNA target, and no matter how they bind, if uh, through perfect homology or imperfect homology, the outcome is only one. They shut down their target because they end up uh, uh, degrading in part the messenger or uh, blocking the translation of the messenger. So the microRNA are one explosive dimension of the non-coding uh, space, but uh, as I said, 50% of our genome is transcribed and there are two additional emerging dimensions completely untapped which would be explosive if functionalized. One is uh, represented by our pseudogenes, which I mentioned already, our uh, avatar genome, as we call it, which are considered relics because they do not express proteins, 17,000 units, which would be great to be able to functionalize. And yet there is another explosive dimension, completely untapped, made by the so-called long non-coding RNAs. Now these are non-coding like this microRNA, but they are long, and uh, they come in thousands. We think we have 10,000 of these. They are expressed in a tissue-specific manner. And again, we don't know what they do. Now, the last uh, uh, point I would like to, uh, to share with you and remind you, which is again mind-boggling, is that uh, uh, through our systematic analysis of the cancer genome, the Cancer Genome Anatomy Project, we are coming to realize what we had suspected already, which is that the cancer genome is a mess. Okay, they think that uh, uh, is a bit disappointing is that few genes are mutated. This is, a, we were expecting, a, you know, uh, fireworks, and on the contrary, only few genes are mutated, and usually the muted genes are the ones that we would like to, to drag. But what we find is that the cancer genome is messy, and actually we find all the rearrangement that we want, the tend, the deletion, tandem duplication, inverted orientation, interchromosomal translocation, amplification, Oftentimes, these rearrangements are recurrent, suggesting some clonal uh, role in clonal evolution. But what people don't tell you, and you can read because this is published in Nature, is that these recurrent events oftentimes, uh, so to speak, fall in the middle of nowhere. And they fall in the middle of nowhere, however, oftentimes hitting transcribed region. And this is not surprising since 50% of our genome is transcribed, as I said. And of course, we put this under the carpet be because we don't know how to functionalize this transcript. There is this aberrant transcription ongoing, these re rearrangements, and we don't know how to study them and we don't know how to drag them. And actually, we don't know how to study it, but uh, we know that uh, on paper they can be dragged. And this will be uh, my last uh, introductory and uh, therapy-related uh, slide. So are we dragging the right molecular space? What about uh, this huge transcribed uh, uh, dimension, which we know, as I said, we uh, can drag, at least on paper, using a new uh, platform, a new chemistry, which is called LNA. I have no time to discuss with you what it is, but uh, it's called locked nucleic acid uh, technology. It allows you to generate very small and very stable single-stranded RNA, which are resistant to exon endonucleases and can be delivered easily in vivo in multiple tissues, but for sure to deliver. So we can drag the RNA by going after microRNA or long non-coding RNA, but we don't know how to functionalize this tremendous noise, so to speak, that we observed in cancer. 
And actually, uh, the first uh, clinical trial with RNA is ongoing. You may have heard about uh, this trial. It's a trial uh, run by a small startup, a small Danish startup called Santaris, which is using the first uh, LNA molecule to go after a microRNA, microRNA 122, for the treatment of hepatitis C, since hepatitis C depends on uh, microRNA 122 to operate. So keep in mind uh, uh, this huge dimension unexplored, the pseudogenes, the long non-coding RNAs, this uh, recurrent chromosomal deletion and rearrangement in cancer which affect the uh, transcribed uh, uh, genome and which we are unable to functionalize. And now let me tell you the theory which we think uh, allows us to predict and functionalize the non-coding uh, space. The theory is based on a very simple inversion of the logic whereby the uh, uh, relationship between the microRNA and RNA uh, operates. We simply put, change the point of view, and when you start changing the point of view, the things that you have never seen uh, before. Now, I told you that microRNA, these small single-stranded non-coding RNA, are thought as negative regulator of the messenger to which they uh, bind, because they can degrade it or they can block uh, translation. Simply put, what uh, we did is to hypothesize that uh, the system would not operate like that. It's not that microRNA are negative regulator of the messenger, but rather that the messenger combinatorially would talk to each other using the microRNA and the seeds to which the microRNA binds to the messenger as letters of a new uh, code, as letter of a new uh, language. And uh, we reason that two distinct RNAs that could be coding or non-coding, say, encoded by gene X or Y, would talk to each other by competing for microRNA. These RNA X, generated by a gene that can be coding or non-coding, would have the red and yellow seeds and would compete for the red and yellow microRNAs, taking them away from RNA Y that also has the red and yellow uh, seeds. And uh, we hypothesize, therefore, that RNA coding or non-coding could regulate each other function through their ability to compete for the microRNA binding attributing a novel biological dimension to RNAs and mRNAs that is independent of their protein coding function. And uh, we call these species, these species that can compete for microRNA, CERNA for competing endogenous RNAs. So a CERNA would compete with another CERNA, and uh, the outcome of this is very simple. And please bear with me, because if you lose me, you will not understand. The logic of this crosstalk is very simple. If in a cell you have two molecules of CERNA X and two molecules of CERNA Y, and you have a bunch of RNAs, and these two CERNA would share the seed for the blue, the red, and the green, and the pink microRNA, these two CERNA would be at the equilibrium, okay, because they would equally redistribute the microRNA. But if now all of a sudden one CERNA would go up, one messenger would go up, imagine in cancer, an amplification or a translocation, now, all of a sudden, the other CERNA would go up because the CERNA X would talk to CERNA Y, y how? By competing and sponging, so to speak, uh, the microRNA, the, the pool of microRNA. Conversely, if a CERNA X goes down because in cancer is deleted or is shut down transcriptionally, now all of a sudden, CERNA Y will go down. Why? Because now the microRNA will go after CERNA Y, will be freed from the CERNA X uh, regulation. And this inverted logic allows us uh, to propose that CERNA operate in trans to regulate through microRNA other CERNAs. So not only our three prime or five prime are cis regulator because the microRNA would bind to the, these uh, elements and block translation, but each messenger, coding or non-coding, would exert a trans -activ uh, activity through the CERNA uh, sponging uh, dimension. And therefore, we hypothesize that UTRs and RNAs are transmodulator of gene expression through microRNA binding and uh, competition. And the implication of this is that any RNA introduced into a cell can have a biological activity completely independent of whether or not it encodes for protein. And the beauty is that this activity is predictable. It's predictable on the basis of the CERNA language. And in turn, this would radically change the network logic. If you think about microRNA, you see them as negative regulator, specific and promiscuous of P10, P21, X, and Y. 
this is not how the uh, network would operate. It's rather that P10 would talk to P21 by competing for the microRNA uh, space. And uh, this, in turn, if you think about it for a minute, breaks and integrates one of the dogma of cell biology, whereby a gene would be transcribed into a messenger and translated to exert its function. What we are uh, proposing is that uh, there is a hidden additional function which is exerted at the mRNA level. So this uh, transcript uh, as a function which is uh, uh, due to its protein, but if it doesn't encode a protein, it still has a function. And if it doesn't encode the protein, this function could be coherent with the function of the protein or paradoxically could be incoherent, creating internal negative regulatory mechanism. And as I said, the, the beauty of all this is that we can predict this function and how the RNA is coding or non-coding talk to each other through the CERNA code, a language that allows fine prediction. And the language is this one. The language are the seeds, A, B, C, D, E, B, B, D. You see this CERNA X is the same letters, albeit uh, scrambled of this sentence. And so you can predict which CERNA will talk to which uh, CERNA. And all of a sudden, you will be able to functionalize the non-coding space, this 50% of uh, transcribed genome, which is the regulated in uh, cancer. Now, the whole story, and I will be very brief, but uh, since it's cancer relevant, uh, started studying one of the gods of tumor suppression called P10, which uh, I'm sure you all know and have heard about. P10 uh, is uh, very important in human cancer, is down in many cancer, up to 70% of human cancer exp uh, experience down regulation of P10. And we know that this subtle uh, incremental down regulation of P10 is very consequential for cancer since we have been able to generate in the mouse an hypomorphic allelic series. So the idea is that any CERNA for P10 would be very important for cancer because it would alter subtly the expression of P10. But P10 uh, is good to demonstrate the CERNA theory also for yet another reason, which is that, uh, as you can see, its transcript is extremely long. And this is something, again, I would like to stress for, for the audience. Uh, when we study a gene, or in the last 20 years, my lab studied genes expressed in the coding, okay? So you study P10, P10, what is P10? A phosphatase, okay? It, it regulates P3K. So you want to study P10 in your lab, you take the, the minimal information, which is 1.2 KB, and you completely ignore the fact that the messenger of P10 is huge. It's preceded by a long five prime, a long three prime. And on top of that, the three prime and five prime of P10 is simply put cover in microRNA seed. So it's a perfect uh, uh, battlefield or playground to study the uh, sponging activity of P10. And what was also relevant to the discussion is that P10 has a little brother, a little pseudogene, which uh, is a transcribed or, or retrotranscribed uh, pseudogene. You know the pseudogenes, the 17,000 genes, our avatar genome, come in two flavors. They are the ones that lack introns, so-called process pseudogenes, that are thought to be ar arising from retrotransposition, but they are also the ones that are uh, thought to arise from genetic duplication, which retain introns. No matter what, we haven't studied them because they don't encode for proteins. No matter what, they share common three prime UTRs. They display tissue specific and disease associated expression, and we know nothing about them because we didn't pay attention to them. So the additional uh, feature of uh, the pseudo P10, which is called P10, P1, is that uh, not only it's uh, not encoding for a protein, but it shares, as you can see, for large part, the three prime with P10, which is in its five prime portion, extremely homologous to P10, and again, cover in microRNA seed. So the pseudo P10, which is expressed, could the pseudo P10, which is expressed, act as a CERNA for P10 through uh, competition? So could the P10 and the pseudo P10 transcoregulate each other through this mechanism. And why this would be relevant? Because if it is the case, then the pseudo P10 is a tumor suppressor because it would impact on the level of P10, levels which are so important in cancer pathogenesis. And indeed, we ended up demonstrating this, and I will show you only a, a couple of experiments which are very provocative and which on purpose I will show you using a very bizarre tool, which is the three prime UTR of the pseudogene. The junk of the junk, as I call it. <laughs> so this is a piece of RNA, 
which comes from a junky gene, and I'll show you that this piece of RNA has a tremendous biological activity. Starting from the fact that if you express the junk of the junk, now P10 goes up. Why it goes up? Because you are sponging the microRNA that go after P10. And uh, if this wasn't enough, uh, the junk of the junk is a very powerful tumor suppressor. So if you take the three prime of a pseudo gene and you transfect your beloved cells, what you find is that uh, the cells go flat, don't grow anymore, they don't form colonies, they don't form colony in uh, soft tiger, so we block anchorage independent growth. And this is not solely an attribute of the three prime of the pseudo P10, but it's an attribute of the three prime of P10 itself. I don't want to mislead you. The, uh, we are not able to functionalize only the non-coding messenger, but also the three prime of the coding protein. So if you take the three prime of P10, which we have never studied in my lab, and you overexpress it, you find that it grows, suppresses powerfully cells. And this for people who do knockout and mouse modeling is a very learning experience because when we knock out the gene, we don't pay attention to the transcript. We want to kill the protein. And when we do transgenic work, we never express the three prime or the five prime. We only express the coding, hence missing this powerful activity. And I will spare you the data. The same is true if you knock out the pseudo gene. Uh, many people say, ah, this is very nice, but it's in overexpression condition. No, 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 no. If you silence specifically the pseudo P10, P10 goes down and uh, the cell proliferate more. Now, the expectation of this is that the pseudo P10 should be a tumor suppressor and it should be deleted in cancer. And indeed, we found that the pseudo P10 is deleted focally. It's located on 9P13.3, is deleted in colon cancer, is deleted in prostate cancer. I'll show you the prostate cancer example. We have generated the fish to study allelic deletion of the pseudo gene, the junk gene. And as you can see, every time the junk gene goes down, the P10 protein goes down. So there is a striking correlation between the loss of the pseudo P10 and P10, and this correlation holds across the board. So they go hand in hand. And they go hand in hand also in normal condition. If you, I were to show you the, their relative expression level in normal tissues, they also go hand in hand. Because of course, if one goes up, the other goes up. They are co-regulated. Now, can you export this? Of course, you have 17,000 new pseudogenes to study. So take your beloved gene and do the game. And uh, for the sake of uh, 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 or of, uh, of completeness, we decided to show a few more examples. And I'll show you actually an example which is relevant to Tyler's talk, which is uh, the KRAS, which is the god of the oncogenes, pseudogene. Now, KRAS has a pseudogene which is called KRAS1P. This gene, this pseudogene, is transcribed again. This transcript doesn't encode for a protein again, so it's a junk gene. We don't pay attention to it. And yet this, uh, this junk RAS has a long three prime, which is entirely shared with the, the parental gene. These three prime uh, shares with the parental gene eight binding sites for LET7, which is a very interesting microRNA, one of the most studied because it's a very powerful tumor suppressor. So could it be that the pseudo -P uh, RAS talks to the RAS similarly with the pseudo P10? With P10, we tested this, and it does. And again, to be provocative, I'll show you the data with the junk of the junk, the three prime of the pseudo RAS. If you overexpress the three prime of the pseudo RAS, now you transform cells. As you can see, RAS goes up, the cell grow more. The two genes, the pseudo and RAS, are co-regulated in cancer. And to make things even more interesting, the pseudo RAS is amplified in cancer. It's in a region which is uh, subjected to genetic amplification. So uh, I'm done, but I would like to leave you with a few important implications, and I will uh, simply read them for you because they are, again, in my opinion, mind-boggling. Now, the first is that we bring into the realm of biomedical research our avatar genome, 17,000 pseudogenes that we now have to study in uh, cancer predisposition, and perhaps we have to drag. We need to drag this space because otherwise we are missing a great opportunity. 
we attribute a novel and uncharacterized non-coding function to our 20,000 coding genes. We have to study them all. When I said this story to, for the first time to Luke Antley, Luke Antley looked at me in disbelief and said, are you telling me that the messenger of PI3K as a function, which is not its kinase activity? I said, exactly. I'm telling you exactly this. So take your RNA, maybe remove the ATG, and disclose the function of the messenger of PI3K. We attribute a predictable CERNA function to long non-coding RNAs. Now we can predict what they do and to which uh, gene they talk. We attribute a putative function to intronic material. I have no time to show you, but introns are spliced out. And they can also act as CERNA. So we can functionalize even the introns. And imagine uh, about alternative splicing, which we often find in cancer. If you splice out an, an, an exon, this has an impact on the protein, but also has an impact on the ability of this messenger to function. And as I said, we can predict this. We call it the uh, target rivalry network. It's a reverse system biology approach, which seems to be very complex. It's extremely simple. And I'll show you what it means. You want to study new regulators of P10, because you like P10, but you can do RAS, whatever you like. You take this string, this messenger, and you simply ask yourself, what are the seeds that uh, you know? And then you do a system biology reverse approach, and you ask, uh, among the transcript, coding or non-coding, which one would share the vast majority of the seeds? And then you pull out hits. And these hits could be coding and non-coding. So we did the first passing experiment, simply taking the three prime seeds, not the whole transcript. And we pull out 21 new regulators of P10, and if I were to show you the protein coding ability of some, you would be in disbelief because the protein doesn't make any sense. Is that the two transcripts talk offline to each other, irrespective of what the protein does. One is a calcium uh, pump. The calcium pump would never be linked to P10 as such, but the messenger can be linked to P10 because it shares this hidden language, which is written there for us to read. And now a few, and this is my last slide, implication for human cancer. Again, one is obvious, pseudogenes and novel oncogenes as tumor suppressor. But this is also very important. Uh, our finding predict that mRNA and protein loss may result in completely different outcomes from the loss of protein only. And why this is important? Because, again, we never paid attention to the messenger. Think about P10. If you lose the gene completely, you lose the messenger and the protein. But if you lose simply the protein because of a point mutation, the messenger is still there, and the outcome can be completely different. And this is the reason why we think that this will allow us to explain also a number of knockout experiments which display differential uh, phenotypes. We have a predictive power to attribute to the junk that uh, came out from the Cancer Genome Anatomy Project. We have a new interpretation for loss of three prime UTRs. I'm sure you know that the three prime UTRs in cancer cell shrunk, shrinks. And then, last but not least, we interpret cr chromosomal translocation in a completely different uh, way. I was raised as a chromosomal translocation hunter. I spent my life working on PMLRR alpha in APL, and I couldn't care less about the messenger. All I could see was the protein, the fusion protein. But now, all of a sudden, it appears to me that the PMLRR alpha fusion transcript is an aberrant CERNA. Why? Because the phi prime of uh, PML is now driving the 3' prime of Arial alpha, and hence the sponging ability of the 3' prime of Arial alpha is completely aberrant. And you can do this game with the transcribed and translated fusion uh, genes, but also with the transcribed and non-translated fusion gene. Before, the non-translated were under the carpet. With uh, these, I conclude knowledge in my lab, but in particular, the CERN Dream Team. Uh, the study was led by two talented postdocs, who have Italian names, but are not Italian, actually, funnily enough, Laura Poliseno and Lenny Salmena. The work is being carried out by now by Miriam Epping, uh, BJ Haveman, Lab Katz, Yvonne Tai, and for what I showed you about prostate and colon, Brett Carver and uh, Jin Wen Zhang for bioinformatic analysis from FAST. Thank you. Thank you for that very provocative talk. So for the CERNs to talk to each other, you have to assume that the microRNA molecules are in movement with yeah. the mouse. Is there enough evidence to show that the relevant microRNAs are... 
So the, your point is absolutely well taken, and this will be uh, taken into account when we computationally do the system, inverse system biology approach. It is known that uh, microRNA in certain cell types uh, are limiting. Some microRNA are not expressed at all in certain cell types. So some of the letters of the code uh, will be not uh, in action in certain cell types. So if the, 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 the sentence that P10 speaks is A, B, C, D, some letters will be not relevant. Some letters will be not relevant because the, that microRNA will be not rate limiting, but some will be very relevant, and it's all uh, uh, relative to the re respective abundance. Actually, there are papers out that have theorized and demonstrated that the relative abundance between the microRNA and the messenger is what drives the, the whole system. And this is the reason why we are all excited if a microRNA goes up in cancer, because if it goes up in cancer, the target will go down. So it's all a matter of the prediction, however, will be limited by the amount. So we have to factor this in. But we can, because we can assess through microarray, microRNA, the abundance of microarray in specific cell types. So we can pre predict which CERNA will talk to P10 in which tissue, you understand, and which long non-coding RNA uh, talks to whatever in that tissue. Uh, my question is, I think, it's partially related. Is this uh, CERNET, this is, uh, by the way, this is fascinating. My first time hearing this, I think it's great. Thank you for the, you know, the talk. And uh, it's a, dis a distribution of the tissue specificity of the CERNET. Uh, I, I'm sure they're probably heterogeneous, I, I guess, so tissue specific. The, the, the definition of CERNA is an operational definition. You know, uh, the CERNA is as such when it can sponge, <laughs> when it can compete. So. First of all, no, you may say, as a, as a provocatory statement, not all the messenger may be CERN. Maybe there is a messenger that has no seed, okay? But assuming that they are CERN, yes, they will display tissue specificity because the CERN is a messenger. So long non-coding RNA will be tissue specific. And as uh, uh, the previous question was uh, implying, uh, these will be relative to the level of microRNA. But uh, again, the power of this is the predictiveness, you know, we can predict it. We, now we can functionalize on the basis of the seed. And we can scan long non-coding RNA for seeds. We can scan introns for seeds. And the second question is, uh, how far back this uh, phenomenon is re revolutionary conserved? In other yeah. words, so you know, vertebrates or non-vertebrates? This non is a, a fantastic question. Actually, this is a, a very humbling uh, uh, discovery for me. I am a mouse guy or a mouse modeler. And I always believed and still believe that mouse is tremendously informative. And yet one thing that is becoming apparent is that the non-coding space, okay, it's uh, when we compare it evolutionarily, is the most divergent. If uh, we are different from a mouse or from a zebra fish, it's perhaps because of the long non-coding RNAs, perhaps because of the microRNA and the non-coding space. So if uh, we attribute function to these guys, can we study them in the mouse? Can we study them in zebra fish? And this is constituted for me a big problem because I thought we could study and, and solve the cancer biology in the mouse. Maybe not. Actually, there are people that say, and this is the accepted theory, that perhaps this is the dimension which characterizes us uh, as a thinking species. Because the question for neuroscientists is where do we store memory? Where, where is the information which allows us to store memory and, and ses sensation? And it is probably in that space that the information is stored. So if you accept that, the mouse is not a good model. Is uh, the mouse uh, conserved in many of these elements? Yes, so some can be studied, some cannot. I wanted to ask a drug ability question. To what extent does anyone on your team looking at the ability of our current panoply of small molecules to interact with the nucleic acid, nucleic acid interactions? Yeah, I mean, th th this is, it, to me, the future. Actually, I'm, I'm convinced that we have to invest uh, a lot on, on, on this space, not only with LNA. And the reason why I'm convinced about that, because if you, you could take a more, you know, concrete approach and say, but come on, at the end of the day, this regulatory dimension will impact on protein anyway, okay? So at the end, we will keep dragging our kinase or our phosphatases. And if I perturb the long non-coding RNA function, I will still be able to track down the output from a signaling uh, perspective. I am a bit 
concern about this statement because it could well be that uh, the perturbation of one long non-coding unit would perturb a number of pathways. So it's not convenient to fix it by going after five pathways. It's much more convenient to go after the long non-coding RNA. So I think we have an obligation as, as a uh, community to devise ways to go after this dimension. Uh, for the P10 pseudogene and the uh, KRAS pseudogene in tumor in terms of uh, deletion and amplification. Uh, so in your computation, do those other pseudogenes always fit the scheme? The tumor suppressors uh, kind of type of pseudogene will be deleted, whereas oncogene pseudogene will always be amplified? Yeah, I mean, uh, is that uh, seen in other genes as well? Yeah. I, 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 we, we are looking into it systematically, but uh, I think you perhaps are implying an even more uh, uh, interesting point, which it could be, as uh, I, I was already mentioning, that uh, the crosstalk is not only between P10 and pseudo-P10, but between pseudo-P10 and the whole microRNA network and the whole RNA space. So it could be that uh, some of the pseudos drifted. They are no longer you know, solely regulating and you may have noticed that this is already uh, beautifully exemplified by the pseudo-P10. The pseudo-P10 has a portion of the 3' prime which is identical to P10, but has a portion of the 3' prime which is divergent. So on its own, the pseudo-P10 is now talking offline to another set of genes which P10 wouldn't talk to. So, but again, this can be deconvoluted. Thank you very much.